Are dairy cows destroying the planet? Should milk cartons carry a skull and crossbones on them? Our healthy ancestors would have laughed at our modern theories about dairy. Today's guest heretic is Phyllis Von Amberg of Darmalee Farm in New York State. As a member of the Savory Global Network of Farms, she knows that raising cows 100% on grass is not only possible, but can benefit the earth and us by regenerating grasslands and producing milk that is far superior to the crap on supermarket shelves. Coming up next on the Nutrition Heretic Podcast. Meet Gina. Gina wanted to lose weight, so she spent two years fasting, detoxing, and dabbling with vegan diets while practicing a shit ton of yoga to lose 25 pounds, but it took so long that nobody noticed. Then, Gina started Frenching her food by eating fatty cheeses, butter, sausages, and red meat, and lost 15 more pounds in only two months. Everybody noticed this time. Frenching your food unlocks the riddle of weight loss that skinny French chicks use to slim down, look young, and live longer despite doing everything wrong. Be like Gina. Start Frenching your food today by visiting nutritionheretic.com forward slash Frenching. Fat is bad for you. I just pop a pill and I'm fine. Meat is murder. (laughs) It's time for bad food punishment. It's time for real nourishment. It's time for the nutrition heretic. The following program is provided as information only and may not be construed as medical or health advice. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. No action or inaction should be taken solely on the basis of the information provided here. Please consult with a licensed healthcare professional or doctor on any matter relating to your health and well being. Hello and welcome to the Nutrition Heretic. This is Adrian Hugh, the Nutrition Heretic, and uh, this week I have my co-host. And say your name because I, I think I pronounce it wrong. No, uh, it's okay. It's Nicola. <laughs> no. Nicola. Nicola. Yeah. Nicola Popovich. Yeah. Pop- Popovich. 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 Okay. Pop-a-pop Smurf. <laughs> okay, that's that's nice. Um, <laughs> okay, so you live you live in Croatia, correct? Yep. And I know I told you, although I'm not sure that you believe me, I I lived with a family for a few summers in Croatia. And uh, one of the things that was a pet peeve of mine immediately upon coming back, because the food there was awesome. Everything like I grew up in the Bronx where everything had to be shipped in. Uh, We had. Yeah, my family did their best to do fresh food. We weren't a hamburger helper kind of family. But there were certain shortcomings in the food supply. The, the, the recipes that I collected while I was there did not translate over to American quality food. And where I noticed it the most was when I was making something called palachinki. Oh. Yeah. And I couldn't, the flour was heavy. And the dairy did not mix in right, and it was disgusting when I made it here. I could I could make it over there, but came right back to the U.S. And between our eggs, our fat, because we didn't have – it was hard to get lard back then. So, you know, those were being fried in lard when I was in Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, uh, the, the milk, our milk was totally different, totally different animal from the milk that you guys have. Whoa. Even the even the the UHT you know ultra high temperature milk that came in the little pyramids, that stuff was way different from the stuff in the carton in my refrigerator back in New York. I couldn't I couldn't get a reasonable facsimile <laughs> of Palachinkin, and it really <laughs> pissed me off. <laughs> oh oh yeah, I can I can imagine. So years later, I discover real milk. I discover milk that is unpasteurized, milk that is comes from animals that are raised on grass, and my whole life changed. 
because and and one of the things that I notice is that here in, in the U.S. and increasingly in Europe, as as many European countries kind of move to uh, an industrial, well, not that they weren't already industrialized, but a more commercialized, maybe is a better word to use, uh, food system, where it's all about the buzzwords and it's all about how can we uh, save more money and produce more stuff at the same time. You know, the, co- the commoditization, let's say, of food. Uh, when we... You know, as I see that happening, I see a lot of the same rhetoric around something like dairy. Oh, dairy's bad for you. It makes you mucusy. It's and, and and have you seen the video in the anti-dairy campaign? Oh, good grief! Don't even get me started. <laughs> have you seen Jokers. that video? I have seen numerous videos, numerous and you, you, the oh, one where man. where they have the calf and they're like, "Mama," you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that one, that one. Uh, and. Um, it was it was a bit explicit. I don't know which version you saw, but my version was uh, a little bit explicit when they show how they do it. You know how they inseminate the cows and right. how they. Uh, you you get the picture. Yeah. Yes, it was gross. Yeah, it's it's really gross. And the point I'm making here is that people have these re- knee jerk reactions to food. So it's all about the shock value. It's just as bad. You know, it's it's bad on all fronts. But instead of addressing the real issue, which is that we have commoditized our natural resources to the point that they are not sustainable, we've got this campaign that, by the way, also produces a shit ton of not sustainable things like, uh, I don't know, soy products that soy are milk. made in factory and uh, what, are, what are those other things that they, they do, The uh, these like fake meats that, you know, they stick electrodes in and <laughs> try yeah. and make it twitch and stuff like that. So yeah, these, yeah, these Franken foods, you know, and, but they're, they're healthy because they don't have animal products in them and they're better for the environment and they're more humane. And I have no idea how they can justify something being made in a lab using God knows how much electricity just to run the refrigerators and the chemicals and the all the the, the different uh, interventions required to make these mushrooms or whatever uh, mimic something that you actually would want to eat. Uh, it, I don't understand how they come to that. So, as you know, Nick, I have a ton of pet peeves, uh, and yours might be that I call you Nick. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I saw this, I saw this quote yesterday on Forbes of all places, and I thought it was very, uh, apropos for this episode because it says, without memory, there is no culture. Without memory, there would be no civilization, no society, no future. And it's, uh, the author of that quote was Ellie Weasel. Uh, the point that I'm making here is that, on both fronts, whether you're looking at the conventional kind of food pyramid, you've got to eat this amount of whatever uh, model, we are getting caught up in taking our culture away, you know, because it's it's all trying to fit into this stuff. So like I talked about the palachinka being made in lard. We can't, you can't use lard anymore because that's not it'll politically, kill right, it'll that's kill you. Kill it's you. Poli- yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, your, your 100-year-old great-grandfather, you know, didn't know what he was doing. That was just a fluke that he yeah, got yeah. To, to be that old, right? Because everybody knows lard's bad for you. And we've got to use all this stuff that was just created in the last 50 years to, to make ourselves live longer. Uh, and really what's happening on both sides. And then, you know, on the other side, you get the people who are saying, oh, my God, don't eat dairy. It's bad. You know, we're the only animals that ever did that. Nye, 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 nye. Uh, you know, even on that side, we're seeing people stripping themselves of their culture and I think this is mirrored a lot in the degradation of our society, not only because of uh, pulling people away from it, it, literally their their culture, you know, because they're they're trying to forget everything that that make not everything, but you know, some of the key components that make their their uh, culture very vibrant. But uh, and you know, a lot of that is going to be centered around the foods that you eat. Uh, but we also see it in a lot of the disease that's resulting from these totally skewed diets that are trying to fit into some perfect mold of political correctness. So with that, we have a guest heretic today. Her name is Phyllis von Amburg, which makes me think that she might be royalty. 
<laughs> of Dharma Lee Farms in New York, which is one of the Maple Hill Creamery Farms. And I, I can even get Maple Hill Creamery products here in Hawaii. So, and I, and they're kind of coveted when I see them because, you know, that, that's the one that we go to and with good reason. Uh, welcome to the show, Phyllis. Thank you, Adrian. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank and, you so and much. And t- tell me, are you royalty? I see the of fun. It's, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, do Franco you collect Prussian, what? <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, does she collect royalties, maybe? Oh, I don't know. So, oh, she, that yeah. would be nice. I wish that were yeah. part of it, but so far, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your farm, what you do, and why you're different from other farms. And, and maybe you can speak a little bit to some of the stuff that I just mentioned about people complaining about, you know, how bad dairy is for you and, and how different your dairy might be from what those people normally think of as dairy. Oh, wow. That's a loaded question. I'd be happy to try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we run a, a pretty typical size dairy here in central New York. We have about 75 cows um, and down to calves. We generally milk about 50 of them. Um, which is uh, pretty normal. Um, it's certified organic and certified grass fed. That's what sort of makes it exceptional on, um, you know, just a commercial level. But um, we are feeding cows with only pasture and stored forages, which is something that, you know, when we began 10 years ago, we were told couldn't be done. And some of the things that you talked about um I was, you know, that I was thinking about when you were talking about this loss of culture and you can't eat this and you can't do that. When we began dairy farming um, and my husband, Paul, and I did not grow up running dairy farms. Um, Paul grew up, couldn't be pulled away from his neighbor's dairy farm, but um, it was not his family's. When we began dairy farming, everybody said, you know, you can't do this. You can't do that. You got to feed them grain, pull those calves away right away when they're born. Um, you know, got to do this, got to do that. And there's a very um, definite culture among dairy producers. And we wanted to get into dairying and do it differently. Um, So some of those practices, the way we raise our calves and the way we feed our cows, um, and even a little bit the way we house our cows are sort of what's uh, extraordinary, I think, about our farm. And, you know, the implications for that culturally and nutritionally are actually pretty ginormous. So I guess that partially answers the question, but I'm not sure if I got to all of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was a lot of questions all at one time, uh, because as you can tell, my, my mind just uh, has all the synapses fire at once, and I have to address everything all at the same time. So what is well, there's There's so much wrapped in in a dairy farm, right? I mean, you know, you just say dairy farm and it doesn't matter if you're somebody that doesn't know anything about dairy farming. It just conjures up all kinds of thoughts. And, you know, it did for me, too. And, you know, it was um, but, you know, a salty old cowboy um, told us that the industry, agriculture uh, needed changing and it was going to be people who came from outside of agriculture that were going to change it. And I think that's probably true. That's that's actually a really good way of looking at it, because I think some people who are perhaps several generations in, uh, they, like you said, like you explained, they think that there's only one way to skin the cat. Yes. What are the excuses that these other farmers are using to have to feed grain? Why, why do they think that this is just the only thing that the cows really need and want? I think that some of these farmers view um, organic dairy production and especially grass-fed production as um, a way of producing milk by exclusion. And, you know, it's really interesting for me to look at the way um, dairy farming has changed over the last 75 years and, um, you know, really market-driven changes to actually confine cows and feed them grains. And, you know, there's there's frankly been some brainwashing on everybody's part to make people believe that, you know, just like for people, we've got this, you know, these are the these are the food groups you need to blah, blah, blah. And we simplify and we've done the same thing with cows. Um, And a lot of the ration that is fed cows today in confinement 
is fed to them because of the ease of harvest and they and because of that they're monocrops. Yes. So you have corn balancing out the alfalfa and the soy and then you've got hay because the rumen needs that roughage for feed and there's nutritionists and uh, academics and everybody telling you exactly why this is the best for the cow and all of the pieces that they've put together but those are pieces that actually replaced the natural existence of the cow. So mm-hmm. they they took the biodiversity of a perennial pasture with all of its plant secondary metabolites and healing factors and they reduced it to a mineral pack and a balanced, you know, protein to energy ration. And so when they say, well how can you feed cows just grass? Well now take away the grain, take away the corn mm-hmm. and you're left with alfalfa and hay. And for a, for a dairy farmer, that's neglectful. She's not going to live on that. And I say, well, I agree. That would be jackass stupid. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, but that's not what we're doing. Right. Um, so there's, you know, the, I try to keep in mind that these people are just, it's, it's internally consistent. Their belief that they have to feed a cow this way, when they think about dropping all of these other things that they're feeding their cow, they feel like they're going to starve them. So right. trying to bring people around and, you know, the gen- on the other hand, you know, you have on one hand, the new people are going to sort of switch agriculture, but some of these farms that are multi-generational and their, their grandparents really held on to pasture for a long time and held on to that, you know, there's that magic in that first cut early June hay, you know, and they still do that. There's a little bit of, um, you know, there's something to work with and you can you can have a conversation about how, you know, really this is a completely different paradigm, but it can be done. Right. Now, isn't it true that many of our grasses are related to wheat and rye? Yes. Yes. So Um, is it necessarily, you know, I'm not saying that it's not different, but for them to kind of raise their arms and flail about about how you're damaging the animal, you're not necessarily yeah. doing something so radical from that standpoint, are you? That's right. No, we really aren't. And um, as you know, more and more, we can have intelligent conversations. But I got to say, unfortunately, it's this bone crushing low milk price. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but they're, the milk price yeah. on the open market is absolutely bone crushing and there's Very no low. relief in sight. So um now these guys are are almost having to open up their ears and listen and and you know from there it really is logical and it really does make a lot of sense now whether or not they can feasibly make the shift um because of economics that's another story because there's so much leveraging happening in the dairy industry that you know they're uh, it, it's hard to move back to an ecological base you know right right um, so, so, I mean, what, what I'm, what immediately comes to mind is, uh, milk production. Uh, because one of the arguments I'm going to assume is that you can't get the same amount of milk. You know, we talk about prices. Uh, right. is, you know, is that, is that, uh, a, a consideration on their part or is that just BS is. that they made up? Is that just, is that stuff totally made up? Is it, is it going to be <laughs> less milk coming out? I mean, cause you know, we're, we're a country of quantity, not quality. That's right. And absolutely. And there, there is less milk coming out. Um, but there's also less stress on the cows and you know, what we're trying, I know what Maple Hill Creamery is, is looking into. Well, is it, it's a lesser volume of milk, but is it, is it actually less food? Because mm-hmm. the density and the quality of the fats and the other components and, you know, a healthier diet in is healthier milk out. Absolutely. Um, there's that argument being made. But, um, you know, again, these guys have been really, you know, when the milk price is down, you put on more cows. You got to make more milk. When the right. milk price is up, put on more cows. You got to make more milk. I mean, it's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the only tool they have is more milk because, when you centralize the production and you purchase all the inputs, all you have is volume. And so that's a tough spot to be in. Right. So. And, and I, I also find it interesting that, that many of these farmers, I guess, because they are uh, in within that commercial network, they're not doing value added products like the yogurts and the cheeses and things that they could be getting top dollar for, or maybe not top dollar, but, you know, uh, more, <laughs> more money for their effort. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Well, you know, it's uh, even, you know, uh, when you look at cow sizes on, you know, what the possibilities are when you look at, you know, 8,000, 12,000 cows or even five or 600 cows. And I think about how much milk that is, because I tell you, even just milking 50 cows here, that's a lot of milk to deal with every day. Um, and you need a lot of people to consume that milk. Um, but you know, that's, that's actually what makes it worthwhile. Right. I mean, um, I I am in an email exchange with a guy in South Africa, who's trying to figure out how to get cows to families and communities because, you know, milk will remediate the starvation. I mean, it's it's sure. much needed food. They don't have food and a cow can turn things that they can't eat into something very valuable and very nourishing. And right. you know, that's the whole idea behind a milk cow, right? Yeah. And, and, and I hear some asshole in the background right now saying, oh, well, black people can't digest dairy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just for the record, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. <laughs> No, but you know, oh, which, see, I, I personally, because I'm black, <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but I, I oh, oh, am. You're black. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. So yeah, so keep it to yourself, Nick. Uh, okay. But, no, but, I won't but tell seriously, anybody. to me, that sounds like I always thought that that was kind of a racist thing to say because I'm a mammal too. You know, like right, right. mammal, a mammal that doesn't drink milk. What are you on crack? <laughs> so. Oh, that's great. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, of myths. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what you find, um, are the, 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 or not just you find, but you know, what is being said about the nutritional value, because you did talk about how the grass produces a superior quality milk. What are the different components that are increased or de- decreased as appropriate, uh, that, make it qualify as being more nutritious and, and just better for you. Now, part of that statement, full disclosure here, is just my conjecture from being a human being and knowing that I'm healthy and that, you know, when I fed my own babies, when I ate well, they grew well. And so, um, you know, there's just a straight logic there. But um, Maple Hill Creamery has been testing, at least for now, the fats um, omega-3, omega-6 fats, and then CLAs, which are the conjugated linolenic acids, which I think, uh, I know they're testing for 12. I don't honestly know how many there are, if that's all of them. Um, and what they're finding is that those fats are, um, the omega-3, omega-6 are in just about a one-to-one ratio, which is unheard of in other milk. Um, so this is from their, their products. And, um, there were just a handful of farms where their individual farm milk, was sampled and the CLA levels were tested and, you know, um, they look great. So this is the beginning of where we are, are going to look. And as soon as we can figure out how to logistically get other components, other, um, trace minerals, other nutrients, um, things like that, then we, we will do that testing and try to make correlations between the practices that the farms, are using to produce the milk and the actual quality of the, um, of the milk. And, and that's where this regenerative grassland restoration is going because the regeneration of the nutrient density, the weather cycles and the community are all interconnected. This is, you know, that's, that's just where it is. And now we've got, we're starting to see the ability to, to correlate this data and one of the ways we're going to do it is by testing, continuing to test Maple Hill Creamery's products and individual farms um, milk and evaluate their practices. Right, right. And just to uh, make sure that people understand what she's talking about, particularly with the omega threes to omega six ratio. Uh, currently in the in the U.S. diet, there is roughly a ratio of one omega three to twenty or fifty. 2250 omega 6s uh and you know generally you actually want like more of that closer to 1 to 1 1 to 2 kind of <laughs> ratio so <laughs> so kind of a know, long way to go isn't it <laughs> yeah we have a long way to go and a lot of that is this uh infatuation with the vegetable oils uh where yes. we ha- again i was talking about lard before you know we're we're no longer consuming these natural fats, but we're consuming these vegetable oils that are extremely heavy on, on the side of, uh, of the omega sixes. 
I am actually looking for something right now, which I, I thought was in this book. I know it's in this book. I just thought it was on the page that I'm looking at. Uh, but I've been uh, reading a, a French uh, doctor's book on um, weight loss, actually, uh, because I, I've written a book. Uh, I think, you know, I wrote a book called Frenching Your Food. And it's about mm-hmm. the fact that the French just love their food. They're so in love with their food <laughs> and they treat it like a human being and they revere it. And, and this is, um, you know, unfortunately it is changing. Uh, but overall they will eat things that are, are naturally good. And one of the things that he recommends is eating about three ounces of cheese first thing in the morning. This is why I'm bringing mm. this up because this doctor says in the morning you need that fat and he recommends drinking yeah. three, three, ounces of cheese so i'm sitting here with a bar of cheese <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and eating it like a hot dog <laughs> every Sweet. morning um, but uh he had he has somewhere in the book the equivalent of the new the uh, nutrient value that you would have to consume in yogurt and milk uh, to get the same nutrient value, the, you know, the density of just that, that, uh, cholesterol and fat. And I wish I could find that darn page. Uh, you know what it is? I'm, I'm listening and, and speaking in English, but I'm reading this darn thing in French. But, <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was well, something ridiculous. Like, you know, at the end of the year, you would be consuming 40,000 gallons yeah. of milk to get the same <laughs> as you would in a few <laughs> pounds of cheese. <laughs> Well, I think, um, you know, a cheese yield, a good cheese yield is 11%. There are some milks um, and some of the grass-fed milks from some of the, you know, different breeds of cattle have different components and lend themselves more or less um, to cheese making. But you can get up to a 16% yield. So, you know, that if you look at just what 11% cheese yield is, you know, it's got to be at least 10 times as much. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> actually, sure I, well, I found I found the page. Here it goes. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm keep in mind I'm translating this. Okay, so he's saying for a hundred grams of cheese, which is about three and a half uh, ounces, uh, you would have to consume five hundred grams of yogurt, which is a pound of yogurt or a liter of milk per day. At the wow. end of a, at the end of a year, you'd have uh, thirty six point five kilograms, which is about seventy five to eighty gr- uh, pounds of cheese. But you would have one hundred eighty two and a half <laughs> uh, kilograms of yogurt. So times that times two point two. That's about four hundred pounds of yogurt and three hundred and sixty five liters of milk, uh, and which bloated, is and the bloated stomach. Yes, exactly. And and I have to say, since I've been eating my three ounces of cheese in the morning, my tummy is not only flat when I stand up, but it's still flat when I sit down. <laughs> so think wow. about that. Nice. Because I, I usually ha- have a, a you know a flat stomach when I'm standing up, and then I sit down, and I feel like you know shooting myself. <laughs> but <laughs> but now that I've been doing this, it makes all the difference in the world. Oh, have you have you this um, have you maybe. Um... Uh, thought about switching to uh, fitness. No, Fit- fitness with cheese. <laughs> it's so easy. You just no. feed them cheese, and there, and there, there you go. Muscles grow on themselves. It, it's it's true, actually. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, and you know, this guy, just like me, he says, "Don't kill yourself at the gym." You know, it's it's nice to have a little a little activity, but you don't have to be, uh, you know, this this like fitness culture that we've gotten into, where you know, like just. No pain, no gain, and less the uh, more is more. Uh, we need to reevaluate that, is what he's saying, because you at some point you start creating a stressor on your body uh, by doing what I call over exercise. And I've seen many people who cannot shed that weight. They've got you know the cellulite thighs and all this kind of stuff, and they're like, "Well, I gotta exercise more." I'm like, "You exercise like seven hours a day? What the heck do you think you're like? You know, when are you gonna have time to do anything else?" <laughs> So, so, you know, we really do need cheese. That's exactly what I'm saying. You don't, you don't believe me. I'm telling you, try it. (laughs) Try it. I am. Okay. I'm a believer. You you might. Yeah. Yeah. You might think I'm a hater, but I do it exactly the same morning, just as you. Okay. All right. All right. You're just giving me a hard time. You're just giving me a hard time to, well, I'm not going to go there. I'm not not going there. So, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I've been told by uh, the Amish farmers, because I used to live in New Jersey, and I would go out to Pennsylvania, 
uh, every like couple of months and get my milk and everything. And they would tell me that they do have the cows on grass all day, but they needed to give them some kind of grain at some point to get them into the barn, like entice them into the barn. Is that something that is a concern for you? And what do you do to get your, your peeps (laughs) in the barn? Uh, That's where I get my exercise. I, um, (laughs) (laughs) I uh, have the cows out all day, but they are generally um, out of food by the time it's milking time. I gauge it so that they are eating as much as I want them, you know, so that they're full, but they're ready for a new patch of grass. So that's a little bit of an incentive to come back in the barn and be milked. And then they know that they're going to go back out to a fresh patch of grass. But, you know, it's actually a, a great time for me to just go out and I walk around with the cows and I call them and we walk back into the barn together. Nice. And, you know, it's it, it works pretty well. Yeah, nice. we, we use sticks here, you know. Yeah, yeah. little switches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smack them on the butt. And see now now yeah. we're gonna have now we're gonna have PETA calling up. <laughs> <laughs> you hit the cow. <laughs> All lives matter. Okay, so uh, <laughs> let's see. So um what do you use then? This is another question I think probably comes up. What do you use in winter? Because it's cold in New York. I've been up it there. It is. It's It's really cold. Um, And cows are pretty good in pretty cold temperatures. They don't like to be um, wet and winded on, you know, like people do, but they prefer to be cold. They are. They're wearing, (laughs) and you know, (laughs) so they, when it's actually the reason we keep them in at night in the wintertime is more to keep the pipes from freezing than anything else. They keep the barn from freezing. Right, right, right. Um, But otherwise, they're outside. And a really funny story I, we've got a a big, beautiful bull. um, And he's just, especially his front end, he's just massive. And you know, he was outside and there's the cows and they've got their eyes kind of half closed and they're just chewing their cud and they're hanging out and it's, it's pretty cold out. Um, and he's like, got his back hunched and he's shivering. And I thought, well, dude, what, what's up? I mean, here, you're the big, you know, you're the guy, you're this massive thing (laughs) and, and you're the one shivering. And it occurred to me that because he's a bull and he's not really producing a lot of milk, he doesn't eat a lot. So he's got a pretty small rumen. And right. here are these giant cows with these giant filled, you know, there's just they're, the microbiome in the rumens of these cows is just enormous. And they've got giant furnaces. Right. So they're fine. They just kind of hang out. They love the fresh air. And the, the winters are, are actually pretty nice. And most of the time they, you know, they go out and graze on the pastures um, into December um, it's February and March in New York that are really horrendous, but we, we will just bring the grass that we harvested in the spring out and put it in the pastures and they go out there and they eat it. So they, they really like to get out, um, almost all the time. Oh, they okay. Just do. Okay. And yeah. so you, you are able to store some, some grasses for them to continue to eat during when it gets really rough? Yes, we do. We do all kinds of really Cool uh, stuff. One one question: Do you uh, preserve it as hay? Maybe we do. We dry it. There's dry yeah. hay, and then we make um, baleage and haylage. So if you cut the grass, just like if you cut your garden vegetables, mm. and then you chop them up and you seal them up, they will naturally ferment with lacto um, fermentation. Mm-hmm. So will the forages. So we cut these, you know, diverse hay fields we plant as many different plant species as we can if we need to replant otherwise we use as many native pasture uh, native fields as we can we roll it all up into a bag and then immediately it gets wrapped airtight in plastic and it will ferment and and it's a very nutritious feedstuff for the cattle nice Mm -hmm. nice yeah Yeah. so it just it just takes it's just like cooking for yourself it just takes a little planning and a little forethought and a little understanding of what the seasons do and what's potentially coming. Right. That's right. Right. Okay. So um, now let's go back to uh, talking about the advantages of the grass fed milk. We talked about omega threes and, you know, we talked about food allergies as well. A lot of people think that because they're allergic, I'm going to bring everybody down with me 
everybody's <laughs> allergic now to milk. You know, everybody's lactose intolerant. What's the difference? Right. What's the difference between A1 and A2 milk? And, and what kind of uh, cattle are you raising? Do you know, do you know uh, what percentage? Um, I do, actually. Um, so A1 and A2 milk, and you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember the uh, specific genome placement or the name of the protein, but there is a casein protein in milk that at some point along our selection for dairy cattle, there was a heritable mutation. And so there's a protein produced in milk and the gene that is a rogue protein, it's not a normal mammalian protein. And the gene that produces this rogue protein has been named the A1 gene. Normally, um, mammalian milk, including cows, is A2. And so um, when you have this abnormal gene and you have the production of this A1 protein milk, it can interfere and be more difficult for some people to digest because it's not a normally naturally occurring protein throughout evolution, you might say. And it's a dual dominance. So if you have um, one gene that is the normal A2 gene and you have an, another, you, your other parent, thankfully, you know, gave you the A1 gene, then your milk will actually contain both the normal protein and this rogue protein. So um, what's desirable is to have double A2 milk is, is what it's called. So mm -hmm. you want both of those genes to have the A2 normal configuration and to have normal mammalian milk proteins produced. So um, it's a very simple genetic test. Um, you can test a small blood sample or even the milk or even, you know, hair follicles, and you can figure out which of your cows are A1 or A2. Um, right now, I think we are probably somewhere at about 25 or 30 percent of our cows are double A2. Um, the bulk of them are A1, A2, and I think we've got a small handful that are A1, A1 cows. Okay. Um, and it, we would love to move as fast as we could to double A2, but um, it's kind of low on the list for economic viability right. <laughs> as right. far as a cow. You know, keeping her spot in the barn, it um, hasn't been. So we've been working on that, oh, I would say aware of it in the 10 years that we've been been farming commercially um, and really selecting, been able to select and move that way and use only bulls that are double A2 for nice. the past three or four years. Wow, that's that's fantastic. So do you find that, you know, because the the A1 is the one that most people are reacting to, and then when they get finally uh, stumble upon this A2 milk, even the, uh, apparently there's a brand that's uh, an ultra pasteurized brand coming out of, I want to say New Zealand. Uh, even that milk, people are saying they tolerate it where they could not tolerate A1 milk at all. Yeah, so I've heard similar stories. So it's, um, I think it can be a pretty powerful thing. And right. But no, nonetheless, we'll nonetheless, with your grass feeding of the animals, that seems to uh, uh, be very important as well as for the, the digestibility and uh, tolerance of milk for a lot of people. Well, yeah, we, I mean, my, my family's pretty much got it all wrapped up. I mean, we just, we just take the milk out of the bulk tank, it, you know, and we can, we can choose some of our double A2 cows and, you know, milk only them and then just drink it raw and be about as happy as you can be on right. milk consumption, you know. Right, um, exactly. But yeah, the, the grass fed and double A2 is, it, 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 it makes all the difference. Yeah. What are some of the, the considerations that you have to make sure that they always have enough grass? In other words, like as, as do you need to move them along in rotation with other animals or is it, or do you have just cows? We have just cows. I would love to add um, other animals as we move forward, but um, right now we have just cows and we use a grazing plan and it it's, uses calculations based on previous carrying capacity. You know, how many cows did it feed for how many days last year right. and how fast are things growing? And we plot out a plan so that we can always have enough grass for those cows to eat in that paddock. And they're not taking more than they should for it to recover. 
And when they come back around, it's, it's nice and happy for them to be back there again. It, it's, um, it's actually a pretty, it, it takes a few days to get through the calculations and the plotting, but I can do that in the wintertime. Yeah. And then come, come summer, we, um, we hit the ground running. Awesome. So uh, I want to use that as a, a little bit of a segue to the Savory Network and and your association there. How how did you become part of the Savory Network? And is your farm considered a hub for them? Yes, our farm is a hub for the, the global Savory Network. And their holistic grazing plan is the plan I just referred to. Right. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. And just holistic management and the mission in general is... It, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't know, I can't say enough good about it. Um, I think it's the thing that will enable us to um, keep going, you know, us as a species to yeah. keep going. Um, it's, it's a way to iterate that connection all of us have to green growing plants on this planet. Uh, you know, we don't have anything. There is no wealth unless we have green growing plants. That's why we can't live on Mars. Right. You know, we, 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 we got to do this. Um, and really understanding the forces at work around the world, how they shift and what each of us can be doing in managing our surroundings in order to proliferate the green growing plants on our planet and what's, what's um, enabling that. So we use that plan to make sure that our cows have enough grass. And the, the whole idea is that the cows bring the grass and they do. And when you manage it well, there's more grass when you come around next time and there's more grass next year than there will be this year. And, you know, that's, that's sort of the embodiment of life, right? That's what life is, right? Sure. Life, life regenerates. That's its definition. Exactly. You know, it's, um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so when, when did you get involved with Savory Network and what was the state of your farm before and how long till it started to really look the way you wanted without the aid of any external components such as the pesticides and the GMOs and all that stuff? Yeah. Um, so we we started on this farm 10 years ago and it was two and a half years ago we we got together with the Savory Institute. So we just jumped in 10 years ago. We found um, Tim Joseph, who runs Maple Hill Creamery, and that was the promising market side of our survival. And then two and a half years ago, we connected with the Savory Institute, and that was um, just in time to start turning around. You know, it's it's a very, um, I don't know what the right word is, but it, it goes away. You know, the pastures start to deplete and you don't know if you should just blame the weather or if maybe this year was a little wetter or, or drier or if you, you know, what, what it was when, when actually things are going the wrong direction and you just don't want to see that. Um, and so now it's been uh, two years of officially implementing this, you know, really getting it right. And we, we've been in uh, actually two drought springs in upstate New York. Really? And we, we have, yeah, and we've been faring just beautifully, um, because we're able to plan through them. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you make your plan, you, you're aware that you don't know what the weather's going to be right. and you base your calculations on if this is happening, do this, if that's happening, do that. Um, and it's, it's been just really, um, really wonderful. And I don't, I don't know how, you know, we're, we're surviving and, and thriving very well and all of our numbers look great. So, even in just two years, I think um, we've increased our carrying capacity from last year to this year from uh, it was almost 12,000 animal days to 19,000 animal days. Wow. So you don't even need to know what an animal day is, but that's a significant increase. I'm just saying because that's more, that's more that's more days than in a year. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, wow, how'd they do that? <laughs> they live in a time warp. Yeah, seriously. Wow. Uh, but you know, so, so it's been wonderful. Right. One of the things I find really uh, uh, heartening about that is that it's not like you had to be doing this for 20 years to see that kind of result. The result is you're only been there two and a half years involved with this, uh, you know, Savory Network um, model uh, or a Savory Institute model. But yet you immediately within two springs, you've been able to benefit from it. That's and, right. And I think have. that a lot and of these other 
techniques that people are talking about don't have that kind of turnaround. Like you're, you're not going to, you know, oh, well, you, like you said, yeah, oh, we had bad weather. Let's blame right. it on the weather. <laughs> Man, it works, but the weather didn't cooperate. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so- <laughs> right. Which, you know, makes me go, but you still lost the crop. I yeah. mean, what does that matter? Right. <laughs> And why don't why don't we do something that's a little bit more sane that will actually, you know, may, it, it will actually work no matter what the weather. Right. You know, let's have that conversation. Well, I, I just it's did. True. I just did an interview with someone about Korean natural farming. And I br- I've been bringing this up every freaking episode. So you know, we got to play this episode soon. But um, I just interviewed this guy about it. And, and it's uh, it's not the Savory Institute um, model, but it has a lot of the same. Uh, attributes in that it's not about go to the, the local agricultural extension, get that soil test. And then That's you know right. what you're working with. It's, it's more about the observations of what's happening. Oh, this is yellowing. That could be, you know, calcium deficiency or pe- potassium right. deficiency, whatever, you know, just, oh, it's wilting. Well, then that's this. So it's, it's a lot more intimate with, uh, it's just like with a baby. You know, you don't know what, yeah. what a baby is really thinking. It's just, it, you know, it's born <laughs> to cry and poop, right? <laughs> and eat. So, so, and that's what they do for the first like 11, 12 weeks. And then they, they crack a smile unless they want something. Then they cry. And it's, you know, you, you have to know that the cry is not them complaining. That's their mode that's of right. communication. So, so, uh, you know, this is the same thing that I think a lot of people are not understanding about their food supply, you know, they're, they're the grasslands, uh, the, the earth in general and, and how it's, it's generating itself. We are totally detached from the signals, uh, that it's sending us all the time. It's so true. And, you know, you need to actually be out there and look and get, you know, start, have some, t- spend some time speaking to people who do look at the land and read things the way you've just described so that you can build that connection and understand what's happening around you in a way that will, you know, not just be commercially viable. You know, this is my dairy farm self speaking, right. but in a way that is going to actually regenerate your land base because that's where your viability lies. Right. And, and, and I love to hear how resilient your land is. Yeah. And th- that is something that I think previous generations, particularly here in the West, are just completely ig- ignorant to. We we just yeah. don't understand. We you know, it's just like how we treat the human body. You know, the, the, the you go to the doctor, and the first thing is, do you need a painkiller? And then you know, and then it doesn't matter whether or not <laughs> you right. have pain. They're just like you, you, you know, just to make you feel better. Do you need a painkiller? Oh, let the doctor kiss it. You know that <laughs> that kind of stuff. That's right. You know, I just. Mm-hmm. Put NPK on there. That's what it needs. It'll exactly. Grow, you know? Exactly. Oh, it looks green. It's healthy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yep. and the person telling you this is drinking a Diet Coke. Uh, That's so, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, take that to the bank. So when you get, do you ever get sick animals or, or, you know, do you see a reduction in illness in your animals as well? Because they're, they're doing what they're naturally supposed to do. The, absolutely a reduction and the the whole existence of the cows here on the farm are is very different um and one of the things that we do that you know can't be done in dairy farming is we we let the cows raise their calves so when when we are going to raise up a cow or a bull to join the herd that we don't milk that mother except for the extra milk in the very beginning. So she gets to raise her own calf and that has built in a vibrancy and a level of health um, that has really, it's made another thing that has made all the difference. Um, But the natural diet, you know, we, we all can imagine that the natural healing um, properties in plants and all of their various components. And when the cattle have the ability to choose those plants um, there, there is a really exceptional level of health and, and vigor in the cows that we have. They're all very strong. They, um, they, they walk back and forth, you know, twice a day. Sometimes it's half a mile or three quarters of a mile out and then back again. Um, and we, we really don't see many health problems in our cows. Um, and when we do, there are all kinds of, um, 
herbal supplements that, that, that are made for cows now. And then, you know, some simple things, if there is, um, a slight infection, vitamin C works a charm, but these, these cows are very close to health all the time. So they don't really, it doesn't really take much to, you know, sort of make them better. They're not on the brink of death, like so many other, um, you know, really pressed beings, even humans are. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, when they are, uh, you just, sorry, you just brought up so many different things uh, and I'm I'm not even sure where I'm going with this. So have you ever gotten (laughs) to the point where you needed to do something as as drastic and I'm I'm going to call it drastic as an antibiotic? (laughs) You know, I, I, I haven't early on. So just to clarify organic um, regulations, you're not allowed to withhold treatment. If it looks like if the vet shows up and says, look, the only thing that's going to save this cow is a, is a shot of heavy, do- heavy duty antibiotics, you're obliged to save that cow if that's what that's um, going to save her. And then she needs to be sold out of the herd and not used in organic production. So there is always that possibility on an organic farm. But there was a cow a year ago that, um, I brought her in and it turned out she was an old cow that I didn't raise. And, um, she had a pretty significant mastitis, um, right after calving. Mm. And I was giving her electrolytes and vitamin C, um, and she was doing pretty well. And I phoned a holistic vet that I know. And he said, you know, you might want to give her antibiotics. And I thought, I don't want to do that, but I did because she was, she was pretty down. Yeah. Um, so I called, I called the vet and he came out and he looked at her and he said, Oh yeah, this is, this isn't good. Um, and he, he gave her antibiotics and three hours later she was dead. Oh. Um, and it was very sad. It was really very sad. Um, but what happens when you have a massive infection is the die off creates such toxicity. Yes. It overwhelms the system. And, and that's what happened. And, you know, it's doubly sad because I, I probably wouldn't have killed her if I had just kept doing what I was doing. Right. Um, so no, I don't, I don't go to antibiotics anymore. Right. You know, it was, I had left them and in a moment of weakness on this other vet's advice, I, I went against what I know is not the right road. And, you know, it was a hard lesson. To yeah, learn. And I think that's something that all of us uh, struggle with. Uh, you go to the doctor, you get it. As a matter of fact, I just lost a, a friend to cancer uh, and she didn't need to die. She basically went into the doctor around Christmas time uh, because she was feeling a little tired. And mm. three months later, she was dead from from three rounds of ke- of uh, radiation. And, and it given in two weeks, uh, she had the last of the three, uh, the day before she died. And it was, mm-hmm. it totally, you know, just, just breaks my heart because she was such a wonderful person. And, uh, but she is someone who, like you normally would go towards the, the natural, uh, side of things. Her, her mother is a nutritionist and has, has a, a more holistic, uh, view of life as well. Not, not crazy, you know. <laughs> Right. But, you know, but, but yeah, you know, within reason. And so the doctors just gave her this scary, uh, uh, you got to do this. You got to do that. Oh, we got yeah. it. And then a yeah. week later, oh, wait, it metastasized, oh. you know, and, and so that, and then they, you know, get aggressive with it. And it's, it, it really is tragic because she, um, I, I hadn't spoken to her d- directly, but, uh, another friend, actually, she didn't really verbally speak to anyone about this, but, uh, one friend happened to catch her on Facebook or wherever, uh, where she was just really beating herself up. And she's like, man, I just went in because I felt, thought I had the flu. And I, you know, they took my life from me. She was saying this, you know, a couple of weeks before she died. She's like, they took my life from me. They, they've ruined my life. And, you know, sure as heck they did. So, you know, I think that all of us, all of this, uh, you know, end up at some point because we're not given those options and there's, there's not enough people rallying around us telling us, you know, just be confident with, with nature's, uh, uh, way of handling this because the, your, your system, your organism wants to be healthy as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, when you don't have enough of those voices in your head and, and enough of that support network, it's easy to succumb. So I, I totally understand how you would go down that road. 
you know, and like yeah, you said. Yeah, and, and we, even with those voices, you can get locked down on a permanent basis. Yeah. Be- yeah. Yeah. Because th- th- that's the su- the sad the part of it. Because there are people that promote um, alternative ways of healing, and they get looked down. Right. Yeah. They they get uh, mocked because what are you doing? Uh, we we have established that uh, it is like this, and you can't tell me that you can just go into the nature and then heal yourself right. just like that. You know, you have to go get chemo. You have to get destroyed. You have to get almost dead to get better you have right. to die to live right and then they're like we That's got it nonsense. at the end they're like yeah. we got it <laughs> but you, wait but yeah. you killed the host you killed the host uh, so but oh, um you know it, it, yeah but see the reason why i'm gonna go off on another tangent here i think the reason why that that happens too is because you've got the complementary medicine slash alternative people who are thinking in a very balanced way and then you have people who are doing things like just throwing dung on everything oh you got a cut put some dung on it you know <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's just clear up that infection we'll put feces on it okay <laughs> and and so and those the leeches. The leeches, yeah oh, well, they're bringing back leeches man they're bringing back yeah. leeches <laughs> and, and wow. sometimes and sometimes i think that we are better off treating ourselves with leeches than we are with things like chemotherapy <laughs> you know what i'm saying you know, yeah. I think I might be with you on that one. Yeah. But you, but you not know, the dung. No, I'm not doing there. I'm not doing dung. <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing dung. <laughs> um I, I did actually run into one of my farming friends this morning. Uh, his name is Kaitea Belford, and he's actually uh, a teacher, and he he handles the gardens at my kids' uh, school. And he wants to know. Uh, just because a- an animal is pasture raised, does it necessarily mean that they're antibiotic and hormone free? And I'm going to add to that. Does it also mean that the grass is untreated? Mm. Um, no, pasture raised actually just means that they have access to a pasture and it doesn't even necessarily mean that there's any food in that pasture. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, so <laughs> truth and labeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was, uh, a little bit of, um, regulation on labeling grass fed status for beef, but none ever existed as far as you know, governmental label laws for dairy. So even grass fed um, dairy products don't necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily mean the cows aren't fed grain. And it certainly doesn't mean that they are not fed any, um, you know, hormones or, or anything like that. Um, so, so bottom line, get your own damn cow, go to the mountains, and then milk it. And yeah, that's the way. That's or, the way. Or, or you can buy yogurt and, and cheese from Maple Hill Creamery. Hello, yes, hello. <laughs> because because Maple Hill Creamery is one hundred percent grass fed. That's right, and they they um, no corn. sought out. It is so cool. They sought out a certifying agency. They went to the organic um, community because they are they already have the infrastructure in place to do third party verification, and they developed uh, a one hundred percent grass fed standard. And and you know there was the need to say, look, there's a difference, and you know you, we need to have somebody verify because you know you can say what you want on on a label, a cheese label. Right, right. And and as far as the grass being treated, have you ever found that there's people saying that the that, you know, oh yeah, my my cows eat nothing but grass. <laughs> and then you find out that they've been spraying like all, you know, Agent Orange on the grass. <laughs> right. That's actually a little bit safer bet. There's not much spraying of grass happening, although there is a genetically engineered alfalfa. Spray. Lovely. So lovely. Um, yeah. They, Thanks, alfalfa. Obama. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Burn so it down. It, that's right. Um, the organic certification is really the only thing that can tell you whether or not um, there's been spraying. Mm, okay, happening. Okay, so the so yeah. or, the organic certification does go that far. It does. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's that's good to know. Well, um, do you have any other questions for our guest today, Nicola? Well, hmm. That's a good question to start. <laughs> Do I have any good questions? <laughs> well, uh, I I would have, but the thing is, um, I did start with this whole raw milk thing. 
Okay. Uh, about two and a half months ago, something like that. Uh, I Is that because I, I put say, pressure on you? No, oh. <laughs> no. Uh, that's because you brought Hilda on me. Ah. That's why. Yeah. So I incidentally did uh, the first podcast for her and it was on raw milk uh, with someone from the Western A. Price Foundation. And it was a really interesting uh, listen, you know, so I got most of my information from that uh, podcast. So I, I really don't know what to ask. I'm sorry. Right. But what we, we, we know that, uh, you, that even in Europe now, they're starting to crack down on raw milk and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, but you can, you yeah, can yeah. still get it from the farm, but they're, they're making yes. it difficult yes. for farmers to actually make a living wage doing what they do best and, and taking yeah. care of their animals properly. Yeah. Uh, th th there's rules and regulations. So, um, I, I just want to uh, chip in on the, um, on what you were talking about way, way earlier back. Uh, with the um, with the feeding grains aspect uh, instead of uh, go uh, grazing, I think it's uh, more profitable for farmers to just keep the animals there locked up 24/7 and feed them grains instead of go uh, out and uh, feed them you know grass, uh, let them uh, be outside, because uh, I see what's happening here in my country. You know, uh, the milk prices are continually dropping down. Mm -hmm. And the farmers don't even uh, make money anymore, right. you know? Yeah. It's, it's, the situation has become like this. So we import uh, milk for ridicule prices, you know, ludicrous prices from Europe that is uh, possibly, I don't know, poison. Yeah. It's, it's poison because you, can, you can't buy it for, uh, you, I'm exaggerating, but uh, 10 cents uh, a carton. Right. You know, right, and right. Uh, and milk that is produced in here, it's it's basically being thrown away because you can't you can't sell it. And the, the, uh, there are uh, many people that uh, this is very grim, but uh, there are many people that uh, committed suicide here because mm. uh, they uh, took a loan, and then they can't they pay saw it back. Yeah, that they can pay it back, and then their life is destroyed and they, they, they just kill themselves because of that. That's terrible. You know, and that's, yeah. And that's the state of the milk industry here in our country. But I think it's uh, the same in other countries as well. Yeah. Uh, well, respectively. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we know that uh, in India, that's a huge problem, particularly with the influx of GMO and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the uh, people who are being paid in the government to tout the benefits of GMO to the local farmers, uh, only to uh, wrap them up in these loans for or, or yeah. contracts to grow this crap that they can't, you know, will fail. And and in the fine print, it says we don't care if the crop fails. You're still you still owe us money. What yeah. the hell yeah. kind of you know everything? I can look. I can buy an iPhone, and if I don't like it, I can bring it back and get my money back. Okay, if it doesn't if it doesn't work, I can bring back you know my VCR to the store and get my money back. Or did I say VCR? <laughs> yes, you said VCR. Did I totally just date part? myself? Well, you know what I'm talking about? Something <laughs> like Blu-ray for crying out loud. And you know, so you know, like pretty much anything else in life has a guarantee. But somehow our farmers are being are are slipping through the cracks, and we're not taking care of them. And and it's it's it, you're right it's it's grim but it's a, a harsh reality what we're going to have yeah, to face sooner rather than later uh, because yeah. you know we can have a soft landing or a crash landing and right now we're headed for a crash landing with no airbags yeah <laughs> so I don't think an airbag is going to do anything <laughs> but yeah we need to we need to really uh, uh, analyze this again because it is it is a, a continuing problem so with that said I am going to let you go again our uh, our guest heretic today was Phyllis Fanomberg from Dharma Lee Farms in New York and she's part of one of the uh, Maple Hill Creamery Farms as well as a member of the Savory Global Network you can find her at dharmalee.com which is d-h-a-r-m-a-l-e-a.com savory s-a-v-o-r-y dot global and at uh she's also like i said part of the uh maple hill creamery farms so uh their website is maplehillcreamery.com thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your insight and knowledge thank you so much adrian and nicola it was definitely a pleasure all right 
Nutrition Heretic Podcast is a production of Savor the Journey, LLC. Our audio editor is Nikola Popovich. Our podcast manager is Crystal McLean, and our operations manager is Linda Hansen. I'm your host, Adrian Hugh, the Nutrition Heretic. You can find us at nutritionheretic.com where you can download the Nutrition Heretic's free shit list of seven health foods to avoid like the plague. You can also listen to previous episodes at nutritionheretic.com slash podcast. Be sure to like us on social media for updates. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash nutritionheretic and on Twitter at NutriHeretic. Contact us with show ideas, questions, or if you just want to be a guest. And don't forget to rate our podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Thanks.